discussion that this was uh, aimed at postdocs, but I, I don't want to disabuse you of that notion right from the start because I know I have some undergrads here and some grad students here and some postdoctoral fellows and maybe even an occasional faculty person. Uh, and uh, this uh, series of discussions that we're going to have actually are equally applicable to all, and they're not just focused at all on how you get a job, although that's something we're all interested in. But Developing a research statement, for example, is something that undergraduates have to do for SURF, for summer undergraduate research fellowship programs. It's something that they uh, certainly need to write or should be writing when they're applying for graduate school, whether they require it or, require it or not, because it's a, a real key indicator to faculty that, uh, that you're interested in uh, doing research. Interestingly enough, teaching philosophy statements are equally appropriate to undergraduates because they may be interested, as I was when I was here, uh, in being a TA or a teaching fellow at an early age. I was a, a sophomore when Carver Mead recruited me once upon a time to be his very first teaching fellow for a brand new class. Uh, it was one of the most exciting things I think I ever did. Uh, of course, we had to convince the appropriate dean that you could, you could be a teaching fellow as an undergraduate, and, and uh, I don't know whether you have uh, more capability of doing that now, but being able to effectively state that you actually have a teaching philosophy is a very useful thing. Uh, certainly for graduate students, it's applicable to qualifying exams. Uh, what I'm going to tell you about in developing a research statement applies perfectly to preparing for the two levels of qualifying exams that you have uh, here at Elsewhere. Uh, it has to do with uh, developing uh, a summary of your research in articulate form for applying for research grants, which is something that uh, many graduate students get involved in, I know mine do. Uh, and uh, uh, teaching philosophy statements are very important to graduate students that are uh, applying even for postdoctoral fellows, where uh, surprisingly, uh, that uh, for faculty like me, interviewing people, I'm stunned and excited when I see somebody write me a teaching philosophy statement that gets my goosebumps going because I really think that tells me something about their mental construct, uh, that they care not only about uh, studying things in science and making advancements, but also communicating them to others, which I think is crucial and a crucial feature of the modern scientist. And for postdocs, it's, it's obvious that these are applicable to the transition to a, a re research faculty career or a teaching faculty career or a community college career uh, or a small liberal arts college uh, career. Reed College in Oregon, for example, or in Swarthmore uh, require both of these uh, statements, research statements and teaching philosophy statements. But more so than that, uh, postdoctoral fellows are involved often in writing research proposals. Uh, and uh, then there's always the next step up, which is uh, the approach to the third year faculty review, and then the tenure <coughs> process at the end of the sixth or seventh year, uh, in which these are both required, again, certainly at USC, and I'm pretty sure at Caltech also. Uh, so uh, I just want to point out that I'm trying to generalize these remarks to a, a lot of uh, aspects of one's career in which you're asked to formulate in an exciting way and in a clear way what it is you do and why you do it. And that's why we're all here today. So welcome to everybody. How many of you are undergraduates, just by the way? I've got a couple. How many are grad students and postdocs, faculty? Wow, 10? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> got you all to look, though. Uh, so uh, this is an interesting merger of uh, topics. Because of the, the CFET schedule, I really usually prefer to split this into two different discussions. But today, what I've done is to convolve the two together. And I actually had a good time doing it because uh, I, I really think the two uh, aspects, which most people think in their brains, is sort of almost one's in your right hemisphere and the other's in your left hemisphere, or one's in your top quadrosphere and the other's in the bottom. They're usually talked about completely separately, but of course, they're intimately. And so uh, toward the end of my discussion of the development of a research statement, I'm going to address how research bleeds beautifully into teaching. And when I get toward the end of the development of a, re of a, a teaching philosophy statement, I'll give you, uh, I think, a, a quite a range of applicabilities of the teaching philosophy back into your research. Uh, I think they, they uh, actually go hand in hand. Uh, and uh, you have an outstanding example of one such person here at Caltech, Richard Feynman, who I was blessed to take a course from when I was an undergraduate here. It's a, a loss to the entire science community and to humanity that he's passed on, uh, but he left an amazing legacy here, which is a instantiated.
instantiated in one way in the R.P. Feynman Lecture Hall, which is 201 East Bridge, which all of us know, physics research conference, 4 o'clock Thursday afternoon. I just want you to know that's been going on for almost 50 years now uh, in the exact same room, in the exact same configuration, except they recently renovated and actually painted the uh, peeling paint corner, which I had lovingly looked at for 40 years, realizing that for 40 years at Caltech and 201 East Bridge, the exact same piece of paint was peeling in the upper left hand corner. But that's another story. So let's start talking about uh, the development of a, a research statement first. And uh, my outline is very simple. First, I'd like to define it. I mean, this one's uh, sort of intrinsically obvious to the most casual observer, which people say at Caltech. And I found out in Illinois, they say uh, it's intrinsically obvious to the least educated. Uh, but uh, at the same time, it's worth defining it because of the fact that usually when you sit down to try to write something, having a clear idea in your mind of what it is you're actually going to put on paper makes an enormous difference. It makes it an awful lot easier. So I'll, I'll uh, spend some time on that. I'd like to talk about its purpose, which is coupled in with the definition. And then I'd like to give you my view on what the key elements are that comprise the research statement and the kinds of questions you should be asking yourself as you write it. I think some of these things will be quite clear to you, and uh, you could have written them down yourself. And I hope a bunch of them, uh, a bunch of the uh, comments I'm going to make are not, not obvious at all. Uh, because I think uh, having read several thousand uh, such research statements over the last 40 years of my career, uh, being on various faculty and student recruitment committees, it's uh, absolutely amazing. The, uh, usually we think of things in standard deviations, but this is one where the standard deviation uh, quality and content is usually about as broad as the distribution of people. Uh, it's, it's absolutely stunning uh, how uh, people either conceive or uh, don't conceive how to put this together. So let's talk about that for a minute. First, I want to define it for you. I think uh, this is maybe a surprising uh, point. It's, its purpose is to start off with defining what your research field is. An awful lot of people skip over this. And they start in on the, the first sentence of their research statement is, well, my PhD thesis on the 135 diphenyl ethylene thermal coefficient of expansion. Boom. <laughs> okay, why do I care? And, and the next sentence, but I, I'm expecting in the next sentence they're going to tell me why, why I should care. And the next sentence says, we measured this by, and then they go on into something or other. And then the next sentence says, you can see from the graph below that there's a bump in the fourth subgraph that shows that some effect that we thought might happen may or may not happen. It goes off into the weeds instantly. Mostly you're writing a research statement not to experts in the field. In almost all cases, if you're writing this to NSF or NIH, I don't care. The panel is not going to be comprised of people that are experts in your field. They're going to have broad knowledge and they're good scientists and they can pick things up really quick. On the other hand, the dean that you're applying to at a university, if you're applying for a faculty position at a university or for a graduate uh, position, the dean may read it, the department chair may read it, uh, people on some faculty committee that will range over all the possible topics in the department that you're applying to may read it. And I got to tell you, when you get a pile of them, we have a faculty competition going on at USC right now, we have 250 applications. Now, if you think you can read 250 applications all the way through and understand each and every detail that all of you would like to have people appreciate, the answer is there's not enough time in the universe to do it. So what happens? What happens is this very thing, the research statement, becomes a focal point of what you uh, look at. And instantly, in the first paragraph, you decide if this application is worth reading. So I highly advise you, as I did uh, a year ago when uh, here and I, I talked, I was grateful for the opportunity to talk to you about the art of scientific presentation. It's the part most people skip over, which is how do I motivate that I'm doing something useful at all? Then let's talk about what it is I did. But if I don't tell you why what we're doing is interesting, not only to us, but to other people and perhaps the world, uh, it, it will get passed over. People just won't take the time to go any further. So I think it's important to start a research statement with your articulation of what your whole field is about. And I've given you two clues. What are the key directions in your research field? You're measuring the cosmological constant. Why? I mean, there is a fundamental reason why that's interesting. But that ought to be stated. 
And you ought to put it in the context of, in astronomy right now, why that's hot. A good sample, uh, example of that might be the statement that, OK, uh, experimental measurements of the cosmological constant, a recent finding over the last uh, few years, are off relative to the theoretical prediction from a basic model by only a factor of about 10 to the 120. It's uh, one of the largest numbers I happen to know about. And it's about as embarrassing to the astrophysicists as you can imagine. Uh, OK, well, that's and that'll catch people's interest to start off with. Uh, and it, it does have an impact uh, in the directions that people are taking to uh, in, inquire uh, how to either measure or determine or calculate or whatever it is you're going to do uh, that particular piece of knowledge. And then your research field should have some promising <coughs> lines of inquiry, too, not just directions that the field is going. But there, you should be able to articulate, once you've been in the field for a while, some of the, the aspects of that field that look like they might develop into uh, interesting uh, avenues of opportunity for research. Then, believe it or not, not first, you start talking about your own research and how that fits into that uh, definition or articulation of your research field. And this can have a number of uh, different components. I'm going to describe this, of course, several different ways. I'm going to tell you what I just uh, from a high level picture what goes in this, but I'm going to get really specific in a minute or two and uh, start telling you about the, the specific content. But I think it's important when you describe your own research to motivate within the context of your field why it is that you chose to do what you're doing, or you and your advisor, or you and your colleagues, or whatever it is, your team. Uh, why is that important to you, and why is it exciting enough to spend five or six or seven or ten or thirty years of your life doing it? This is something that is uh, lost on an awful lot of people when they try to write these things, that an undergraduate typically is working on, well, this is Caltech. So normally, I would say undergraduates work on problems that are 20 minutes to a half hour long. I remember some problem sets here where that just does not apply. <laughs> so undergraduates here got immersed in problems that are a few hours to sometimes a few days long. Grad students immediately have to make the transition to working on problems in the beginning that are maybe three months long, but by the time they graduate are four or five years long. And then you become a faculty member, and instantly you're thinking about things that may take you uh, somewhere between two decades and the rest of your life. The project that we're working on, and Noel mentioned uh, an intraocular camera to restore sight to the blind uh, that we can implant in the eye. It's about three millimeters by four millimeters and three millimeters in diameter, four millimeters long. It's one of the hardest projects we've ever attempted in our group. It involves an intimate inter uh, interaction with the medical school. Uh, it's highly interdisciplinary. Uh, we have more boundary conditions uh, for the problem than I'd like to shake a stick at. Uh, but we're really motivated, and it's very much a long-term goal. We've worked on it for eight years already. It's going to take us probably another three before we can start uh, some of the pre-surgical uh, implementations, and then there's a whole FDA approval process for that aspect of the uh, retinal prosthesis that the FDA finally approved for U.S. sale just a, a week ago, and it's been in the news. In the uh, our, so there's this this uh, the motivation actually has to be coincident with how long the problem is that you're working on, right? You got to have a lot of motivation if you want to work on something for several decades, and the motivation can't be it's what we're we're doing, or it's what my group does, or it's what I have done, or worst case, I can't think of anything else to work on but this. <laughs> that tends not to fly. And then it's important to put both long-term goals and short-term goals in. I, I'm stunned that most people understand this one intrinsically. They'll, they'll write us uh, statements about how uh, next week they're going to work on this, and two weeks from now they think they're going to submit a paper, and that's about where it stops. Uh, the fact of the matter, by short-term goals, I mean the next year or two. I'll, I'll discuss this a little further in a minute. And by long-term goals, uh, I'm thinking you ought to have a plan in your mind by the time you're going to be a faculty member that you can see out at least five or seven years, and maybe longer, in terms of not just the immediate research that you're working on, but how it fits into uh, a more global investigation. Uh, people don't like to know that you're going to measure that 135 diphenylethylene thermal coefficient of expansion, and you're done. You know, OK, it's 3.07 times 10 to the minus 13 something or other. Who cares if that's the end of, of your vision for where you're going? 
hopefully it fits into a context that generalizes in some particular way. And here's a, a chance for you to talk about that generalization. Most people skip over approaches. I'm going to go into this in detail again in a couple of minutes, but most people, I, I'm stunned. I can read a research statement, and by the time I'm done, I have no idea if this person's a theorist, an experimentalist, or is doing numerical simulation. And, and you probably can't imagine that that's true, that somebody can write an entire three or four or five page research statement and not give a clue about what they're doing. Ah, but they forget key little word changes can make an enormous difference. So they say, they, I've discovered this. Well, you can discover it any of those three ways. And they have determined that this is the magnitude of this effect. Well, you can determine that multiple ways. But at some point in time, people like to kind of know if you're an experimentalist or a theorist or both, or uh, you're good at numerical simulations, or you can, you can handle all three or something. So it's important to include how you're going about the work and not just what it is. Uh, you notice I have results way down here. We've actually talked for quite a while now already, and now we're talking about results. This is the thing I'm used to having people when I go to a professional conference, and you've probably seen this too. Uh, the standard talk is there's a title slide, then somebody has a graph with some bump in it, and they're trying to tell you why this is important. And they've skipped over all of the other things that would have given you a clue as to why that's meaningful. So at some point in time, you're going to put in the results that you have to date, but they ought to be in the context more of what it is that you're doing and why it's important than just, uh, oh my gosh, we, we measured something. Uh, then it's important to include, I think, specific research proposals in a research statement. That's really what it's for. It's not just a summary of what you have done. It's not a summary of what the rest of the field has done. It's really a projection of where you're going based on what you've done. That's the key thing that people are looking for if you're writing them something to fund you, to pass you in the quals because they want to see where you're going for the PhD, to uh, uh, decide that you ought to be a faculty member and you're going to set up a program there in a particular area. They want to ask themselves, is it fundable? Are there grad students going to be interested in this? Is this something that's compatible with the other things we're doing in the department? Are there potential interdisciplinary collaborations that are going to spring up? These are the kinds of questions that are going through people's minds. And so when you think about that ahead of time, that tells you a little bit about how to write it. And then finally, the third major component of a research statement, or in, in, in terms of a definition of it, if you want, is it's important for you to convey that the field is important. Not just you have a field and things are happening, but that you've chosen something that, that could have an impact, and that your research is important to that field, namely it contributes to that importance in some way, and that you understand how that works. Let's talk about content. This is a, my second pass through this idea of creating a research statement, where we'll uh, start off uh, in, in sort of a linear order with what ought to come first and then uh, second, et cetera. And of course, this is uh, all uh, based on what we just talked about, that, that whenever I mention some of these things, then there's a, a transition to understanding how you're articulating the whole field versus what you're doing in the field and its importance. But I think in, in both of those cases, you've got to state what the problem is. The very first professional talk I ever saw at a conference in Rochester, New York, at an Optical Society of America meeting started with a title slide, and then the next slide had 30 columns and uh, 30 rows and 900 numbers. And all the columns and rows, the, 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 the rows were uh, labeled by 17-digit and uh, alphanumeric characters, something or other. And the top columns were all labeled by uh, various uh, variables, S, S1, P3, R27, whatever. The audience essentially gasped when the first slide came up, you know, because you can't imagine somebody would actually do this. And so we're all thinking, what's going to happen next? And the guy says, well, you can see that uh, S1 here for 10605 alpha, 10204 is 3.7. And you're thinking, no, I'm not going to read the second. <laughs> P3 uh, for alpha 1020509 is uh, 9.3, and this went all the way across to the right side. And we thought, okay, maybe this is an example that's going to lead to a point. So in the second case, uh, S1 is uh, 3.6, it was a little smaller than 3.7, as you can see, and it went all the way across to the right. So now people's heads are moving around liberally as we're all appreciating that we're in an audience and we're trying to figure out what's happening. And this went all the way down. This is a measure of my own ability to be a sucker. 
that this went all the way down to the bottom and none of us moved yet. Okay? Now, there was a lot of discussions. You could start to hear the verbal in the room by the time they got down to the bottom. But I think all of us, you got to be fair to us. Yes, we were suckers for sitting through that slide. But on the other hand, we really wanted to know what was coming next. So I think that's fair. So let me just tell you what happened. Next slide, another chart, 900 numbers, and the auditorium cleared out in a femtosecond. <laughs> <laughs> and the guy was so busy standing up there going across the numbers, he didn't notice until he turned around and there was no one there anymore, right? So what, what didn't happen is any statement of the problem. In fact, in my classes, I demand that students show me a system diagram in any talk they give. I don't care how long it is. If I don't see a system diagram in the first three slides, you're not going any further, period. I'll just sit you down. And by a system diagram, in any one of the disciplines that you're in here at Caltech, there is such a thing as a system diagram that says, what is the, the context of the problem that you're working on? And what is the piece of it that you're actually doing, drawn in a figure in some way that's illustrative enough that almost anybody can pick, pick it up, right? and that you can explain so people get what it is that's interesting, why there's some phenomenon that is not understood that you should spend any time working on at all, and what it actually is. So if that problem set or problem or problem set is not stated, then people will have no clue what it is you're going to say after that. It should be broad and inclusive in the sense that, remember, we're talking about putting this in the context of the field and also in the context of the research that uh, you're doing. And people want to know when you state the problem, is it a single issue or is it a potentially a new field? Is it a, uh, a one time, there's one more thing that we don't know, you know, the last chemical element we don't know the mass of and all the other ones are measured and when this one's measured then we're done and we're going to go on and do something else? Or is it something that's uh, more generalizable if you're right at the beginning of something that you think may turn into an exploding new area? It's important to summarize the, the state of the art. Uh, namely, to mention that there are other people in the universe working on this too, not just you. And that you know a little bit about the fact that there are other people in the world working on it. And that uh, you can summarize the current status in just a paragraph or two. It's not extensive, but just enough that people know that you know that other things are going on and that you can attribute uh, some of the key contributions of others. This doesn't mean citing all kinds of papers. If you might say you want to uh, first measure this and. 1963, and uh, Yamamurti first uh, provided an explanation for it in uh, 1978, and uh, uh, these other five gentlemen, or uh, ladies and gentlemen, have contributed to it thereafter, and now we're interested in the next level of understanding, which is to take such and such a model, and et cetera. You see what I mean? So that people know that you're conversant with what's going on in the rest of the universe. It's important to discuss as I mentioned earlier, your research methodologies and approaches. And I mentioned the three obvious ones. The old uh, way of bifurcating life was to divide people into theorists and experimentalists. Uh, uh, you, as a scientist, will uh, wonder which one of these you are, and you'll base it on whether or not you basically work in a laboratory building things or whether you actually do calculations. Most deans don't think of it this way. Deans think of it as cheap, expensive. I just want you to know. That. <laughs> they see this word, they read cheap. Uh, you know, I got an office, maybe a computer if they beg, and some paper, and nothing else. Here, uh, I'm talking a million dollar setup fund in some cases. So, and a lot of lab space, 3,000 square feet. So they think very differently. You got to be careful how you identify yourself when you're applying for a job. But I think this uh, area, computational and numerical simulation, is really a third way of doing science. I'm not willing to really put it under either theory or experiment or a little bit of both because it's really some of each of those, but really something else entirely. Because it has to do with modeling things for which sometimes we can't generate analytical solutions. And sometimes the model, uh, like a, a finite difference time domain method or something like that isn't really, it's based on some original mathematics, some original theory, but the, the theory of the problem that you're actually working on to which you apply it may not actually be known. You're just trying to figure out what the basic phenomenon is. And to decide whether it's worth writing down a theoretical model uh, and under what circumstances and which assumptions or whether it's worth uh, building something that 
methods that would allow you to determine some particular property experimentally. So I really think in this day and age, that's a, a third uh, type of research methodology, methodology or approach. And there are more, uh, depending on what your backgrounds here are, are and what departments you're in, uh, you might be doing an observational study uh, as uh, many biologists do, in which you're actually trying to figure out uh, what set of species are in a particular area, all the way back to Darwin. It could be a classification uh, or categorization or cataloging approach to something, which often people do in astronomy when they're actually trying to decide how to differentiate uh, galaxies that are far away and far back in time and uh, for which the classification system still is not agreed upon. It could be design oriented, which is uh, for those of us that, that have uh, both a science and an engineering background, many problems actually re revolve around having a set of boundary conditions like the intraocular camera I'm talking about. I have a surgical condition that has to be, has to be able to satisfy my own uh, retinal surgeon, Mark Dumayan's ability to put it in the eye. It's got to uh, satisfy uh, some thermodynamic conditions. It can't dissipate too much power, can't raise, raise the temperature in the eye. It has a mass requirement. I have a size requirement. I have a, uh, a resolution requirement that we actually determine from human psychophysics and not from uh, something fundamental having to do with how we build optics or cameras. And all of these things interact to tell us how to approach that particular problem. So in that sense, it's neither theoretical nor experimental nor computational. It's a little bit of all three, but focused on trying to design something. Of course, you're all aware of hypothesis-driven research. And if you work on anything that involves NIH funding, you have to be aware of this because they demand it, whether it fits your re research methodology or not at all. And that involves you <coughs> describing what you are doing basically as an up-down vote. They would like you to state uh, the challenge that you're facing in such a way that you can either say, I prove or disprove this challenge. It's, a, it's an unusual way, in a way, of constraining science. I think for some things it's really useful, and for other things it's, it's quite limiting. But it's just an interesting methodology. And there's also area-defining uh, research methodologies approaches, which don't really fit in any of these categories, uh, but in which you're exploring something brand new and maybe by a new method that doesn't fit so that you can develop a whole new intellectual territory and not just a discovery. So that's all I'm saying here is that when you're describing your research, it's important that you use some of the words that let people know that you understand you actually have a method between, behind what you're doing and that you chose it for a reason. We're doing the experiment because, or we're, we're writing down a theoretical model because, and, and it ought to be not just, oh, I'm a theorist, so that's what I do. It ought to be because that's a valid approach for this particular problem, and you think you can actually make mileage out of it. I hate to say this because, again, it's, it's kind of obvious, but it's important that people know that, that the problem that you're working on is relatively unique. They want to know that it's something that's new. They want to know that there's some originality in what it is that you're doing. So it's not just the problem, but the approach to it. It's often that combination that really is the uniqueness of what it is you're doing, and neither one nor the other. Last but not least, again, something that an awful lot of people put first, but last but not least is the progress that you've made to date on all of the above. Maybe a summary of your PhD thesis, uh, if you're close to having it written, if you're an undergraduate, it could be a summary of what you did last summer under a CERC. Uh, write in here anything that's applicable to what you've done to date. And if you have publications uh, already out or in, in preparation, it's useful to summarize those. Uh, people don't like to just get a list in a research summary of references. They want to know what you did. So, you know, we published a paper in Nature in which we showed that and then write one sentence that actually people can read in English uh, or some other language to which you're writing to an institution where you hope they read that language, that's okay. Uh, but it ought to be written in such a way that people can actually access it. Uh, and by that I mean that they can take your sentence and quickly understand what it is you think you did that's important. It, by the way, is a clue to all of you is how to get a paper published in Nature is to be able to have the first couple sentences of your paper written that way so that uh, referees that are often out of your discipline uh, reading these and deciding which ones get published uh, kind of get that goosebump reaction uh, by reading the first couple of sentences. And there's more. 
you'd like to be able to state somewhere in the research statement what the impact is that you believe you're going to have on the state of the art today, whether you had it already. Maybe maybe there are some things that other groups are now starting starting to follow your methodology, or there's a mini workshop that was just held that's based on some of the things you and your group have come up with, or this critical breakthrough you think is going to uh, form the advent for a whole new direction now because up until now people thought you couldn't do X and now we're saying you can do X and so it's uh, it's clearly had an impact on the state of the art. That's a very important aspect. By the way, that's important for nature and PhysRev letters and chemical physics letters and applied physics letters and optics letters and all the other letters related journals uh, is that people are asked to assess what they think the impact is of the research that you're doing. It's important to include uh, proposed research initiatives, and I mentioned this earlier, but I'll go into just a little more detail. By near term, I mean the sort of thinking we all do when you're working on something and you're not quite done, and you can easily tell people, well, based on what I just told you, the next three steps are this, this, and this, and will be done in the next year or two, uh, and we expect to write those up. Midterm means thinking five years out, once we've got this piece done, then the next obvious thing we want to do is something or other. And uh, a variant of that, which may seem strikingly different, but really is related, is why, and you're going to work on that at the same time, and you expect over the next five years that, that, that those areas will mature. I also like to see that somebody can think five or ten years out further than that, so now 10 or 15 years out, and say that the whole reason we're doing this is that eventually we should be able to develop something or other, whatever it is. And so that you've actually thought about how the work you're doing immediately now fits into a longer term scheme. These, forgive me, when I write these down, I, I also want to make sure that you understand I don't mean that everybody's got to write this in every research statement depending on what you're doing. I have uh, a third of you are postdocs in the room. And sometimes you're doing a postdoc in a new area because you want to get some breath. So what you're doing now may not have anything to do with what you did for your PhD. And what you're doing your postdoc on may be very constricted by the particular postdoc you have. It isn't what you really want to do. Great, but now you're writing for a faculty position and they do know what they really do want to know what you want to do. And you can't just say, well, think of something when I get there. That doesn't work very well. Or, I hope you'll tell me when I get there. That's a for sure right in the garbage can. What they want to know is that you've actually thought, given the kinds of experiences you've had, what you would like to propose to set up. What, what kind of a group would you start? What are you most excited about? Are you most excited to continue your postdoc work? Or you did your postdoc and you, you had to do it, but boy, you're never going to work in that area again. I mean, it's okay to say that in, in a very nice, gentle way. Uh, but you basically want to let people know that you have a plan for where you're going. Because one of the things that people judge you on is your intellectual independence, of course. That's what they want to know. All the way at the undergraduate level when you're writing a search proposal. The people that are reading it want to know that you've thought through the problem and that you've got a plan. In that case, near term might be the first month of the summer. Midterm is the second month of the summer. And far term might be, well, by the end of the summer and then possibly the year after that, right? These things can all be rescaled depending on what it is you're actually writing. It's important to address the end goals of your research. Namely, if everything works out the way you said it's supposed to work out and the way that you're praying and hoping, it, et cetera, what can you envision is going to be the net result? Can you state for people in simple language what the field will have, what the universe will have, what the world will know if, in fact, the research track that you're working on right now uh, all develops. And back to our famous example of the thermal coefficient of expansion of some compound, clearly that isn't the end result. It's not just that you want to know what the number is. It's that somehow that material must be useful for hopefully something else. And if it expands more than a certain amount, that means one thing, and a whole bunch of applications will be enabled. And if it expands less than that amount, a whole bunch of other applications will be enabled. But that you can see that it actually has a potential impact. That's the end goal of your work, for which this element that you're working on is a piece. And lastly, my advice to you, not everyone follows this, is I think it's important if you're applying for a university position in particular, but I rather think that this is just as important 
NSF now treasures this component in the research proposals, and other agencies like NIH are coming around to uh, not exactly explicitly require it, but they look very favorably on somebody who shows how research is incorporated in teaching, or in the classroom, or outside the classroom. And I'll give you three examples of how you might think of that. One is that, for example, you're applying for a university position, and you say, you know, this work that I'm doing is in a brand new area, and we could develop a topical course in this area that would be very exciting to students. Uh, and I'd love to teach it. And uh, so in this new and emerging area, here's something that you'll be able to add to your teaching portfolio that comes straight out of the research lab. The second thing that I think is, the second component I think is extremely important is the exploration of research methodologies with students when they're young. I don't know about most of you, but almost nobody ever taught me anything about how to do research. What you got taught, ladies and gentlemen, is how to solve 6,000 well-formulated problems that were all three, line long, three lines long, that all had three variables, and the letters the variables were in agreed with how the text three pages before where the problem was assigned used those variables so that students could find it easily. And you, you graduate and you think that's what science is all about. Why? Because the educational system beat you into thinking that that's what it's all about and never told you that somebody has to write those problems. We don't get them as professors like mana from heaven. We go out to the, uh, past the San Gabriel Mountains to the desert with a wheelbarrow and we just shovel up all these nice, well-formulated problems and bring them back. So the fact of the matter is, I ask my students to uh, write me problems. I'll get into this more when we talk about the teaching philosophy statement. I have a way, uh, which I love, of teasing them into understanding how to do research by having them come up with a hypothesis, which they've never been asked to do before, formulated in a problem which is articulate and clear and anybody else in the class could solve, which gives them enormous grief. You literally cannot imagine how much grief that causes. It takes me almost the first semester in my graduate optics class to get people to write me one problem. It has constraints, you see. It has to be about eight hours long. It has to be in the time it would take you to solve it, it has, so that they learn about scaling research to the kinds of resources that are available. Absolutely critical for writing a research proposal to NSF. You can write down the best idea in the world and you ask for eight, the typical 80K. And they say, there's no way you're going to even start this problem with 80K. Let's not fund it. Right? They want to know that you've scaled what you're going to do to the resources you have available. I think you can teach these things. And it comes out of my understanding of how to do research now, which I wish somebody had told me way back when, but you learn the hard way. And now I, I very much incorporate this in my teaching, even in my practice. And then last but not least is this uh, concept of problem statements. I, I just hinted at that. And the related research projects that evolve from those. So my second semester graduate optics class has no homework, no exams. It's taught as an actual graduate class. I don't know if any of you have ever taken one. But it's actually a seminar in which the entire goal is come up with a hypothesis, write the problem. That's what you work on all semester. I lecture about half the time. We, we sit in an auditorium like this. Uh, each person stands up every week or every other week and talks about how they're developing the problem, how they're formulating it, why it's interesting, what they're going to do about it, and we give them an enormous amount of crap for an hour uh, in the sense that they get honest feedback immediately on the pluses and the minuses, and if there's an issue that comes up, we try to solve it as a class. It's an absolutely fantastic experience. The best, most fun I ever have teaching. And so these re research projects actually evolve out of this process of asking people to come up with a problem statement, to actually write me a problem for the first time instead of assuming the universe is going to give you problems. You have made it through half. <laughs> I'd be happy to answer any questions. I'm not getting peppered with them here. But if you'd like, I can either continue uh, to talk about the teaching philosophy statement, or we can stop and talk a little bit uh, about questions you have about writing the research statement. Yes, sir. Quick, quick. Uh, on the different types of um, of approaches, how would you, if you were going to develop a new methodology, like a, a new analytical technique, or how would you frame frame that? Well, it depends. If the analytical technique is truly that, if it's an analytical technique, then it's probably a theoretical approach. Right? And 
I meant uh, an analytical, like a instrument uh, analytical an instrumentation. instrumentation. Okay, yeah. well that's likely some combination of theory and experiment and numerical simulation. Yeah. It's also design oriented because of the fact that you're going to design an instrument. So there's a theory that underpins the measurement. There's an experiment you've probably done, a preliminary experiment that shows that this might be viable. Uh, there's a numerical simulation that you did to show that if in fact you made the volume this small and if in fact you got this many photons out that you could actually measure that cross-section to this kind of precision, right? And then there's the design problem which says, okay, that's nice, this all looks beautiful, it's a, you know, the, the perfect massless spher uh, spherical uh, origin of the volume and then the, uh, the detectors are all perfect. Okay, but now let's actually try to put in some real uh, constraints. There has to be a physical chamber and then the window's only this big and it's only got this much field of view and I need detectors that are this far away and it has to be cooled, you know what I mean? And that's design, right? So I would cast that problem, the one that you just brought up, in terms of four different design methodologies. But that's beautiful because you see, most people wouldn't mention that. They just say, we're designing an instrument to X, whatever it is you're doing. Oh, that sounds okay. But if you tell me that you've actually done the theory and you've done the experiment and you've done the numerical simulation and you understand it's a design problem and here are your constraints, I kind of think you're a gifted scientist because it's clear that you're conversant with the languages of all those approaches and that you understand the value of each one. You see what I mean? The same paragraph, just written a little different from this perspective. Does that answer your question? Yes. Other question? Yes, please. What's the best way to deal with research which uh, includes multiple fields. So for example, I'm doing applied mathematics work where my advisors in graphics and one of my interests are more in the whole numerical analysis, more purely kind of thing. What's the best way to talk about that? Uh, I think similarly to the last question, you, you, can, you can say, I guess you're the one who's proposing the research. So you get to decide how you think the central theme is of the work. So you're more interested in the numerical analysis. So you're going to say, that's my, that's my central theme. And by the way, this has huge applications in graphics because, for example, right, you don't limit it. You say, for example, and you list four or five different things that come from your research group. But also, it's applicable to this and this and this and this. And in my future research, I intend to not only continue the work that we're doing to apply these new techniques to graphics, but also to expand into this new emerging area. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Yes, please. Uh, yeah. Um, you talk about the uniqueness of problem, uh, problem yes. and approach, but at the same time, um, especially for, for example, NIH grant, you're going to have to balance it with sort of feasibility, meaning you have to say that you have a good chance of being able to do it. And if the approach is very unique, of course, by because it's unique, you don't really know for sure whether it's going to really work out or not. So I'm kind of thinking of how to strike a balance of you know, saying that your research is unique, yet it's feasible. That's a great question. You know, the, the answer is that those are two different things. Feasibility and uniqueness, and uniqueness are uh, peripherally related, but not intimately related. So number one, uh, you want to know if the problem that you're working on hasn't already been done. That's part of uniqueness, right? You could say, I'm measuring the 135 diphenyl ethylene thermal coefficient expansion. It's been measured 27 times. The current standard deviation in the world is 0.017, and we think we can measure it to 0.016 and we're using the traditional technique and we're not really doing anything different. We just think all those guys are losers and we're just going to do it all. That's not going to go across as a unique problem, right? But if you say, you know, we think, uh, well, you don't want to say they're losers, but you basically are going to imply that you think that they didn't do it as well as it might have been done because you have a new way of doing it and you think that your error bars are going to be smaller than theirs. Uh, and what's the feasibility part? The feasibility that NIH requires is you've already done a little bit of the measurement and you've already demonstrated that it's likely going to be successful. That's where the second piece comes in. Okay. And but so I mean, by saying the that uniqueness the doesn't mean it's, it's hard. Unique doesn't mean hard and unique doesn't mean infeasible. It just means novel. Feasible or infeasible can be done on something that's either not unique at all or something that's terribly unique. So they're really two different axes of the problem. Yes, please. 
Um, I have two questions. First, regarding the definition of a res uh, research statement. If for job application, uh, I was asked for writing a research proposal and a research summary, I assume by what you have covered so far, that break down the research statement into two parts. Uh, why the research proposal more emphasized the future work? That's exactly what we talked about, though. And the research summary. See this? Here's the, here's the research proposal. See this? This is all research summary. This is all what you uh, stating the problem and what's been done and what you've <coughs> accomplished and what things you've made progress to date. That's the research summary. But so they're, they're, they're blended together. You, you don't have to make them two separate statements. If they ask you explicitly, please send me a summary of research, then take all the things in here that, re that relate to summary of research and write them in the first document and take your research proposal and write it in the second do document. But if you're smart, you'll, in, you'll, you'll make the two documents relate to each other. They ask specifically into two. No problem. Okay. I, you know, there's no there's no statement I can give any of you about how to do this that won't be completely uh, destroyed by uh, different universities and colleges' ways of asking you for stuff that, uh, frankly, you ought to have the autonomy to tell them. Trust me, there will always be uh, counter examples of people who ask you for things. I think the point is you can phrase them, uh, rephrase what's here into those <coughs> bins. Uh, and I, of course, I, I, I wrestle with the universe when that happens. So if somebody asked me for those two things, I would write them a research summary that has a mini proposal for the future at the end, because I can't write a research summary without telling you where I think we're going. And I write the research proposal by having a mini research summary in the beginning, because you can't understand what I'm proposing unless you know what we've already done and why it's important. And so I'd actually write mostly the same document twice, one with an awful lot of detail on one side and one with an awful lot of detail on the other, but I sure would not divide them in two parts. But here's the dilemma. When you apply a job, they typically would you would like you to propose a research different from your postdoc research, prove you can think independently. Not true. Not true. Absolutely not true. Okay. In some cases, uh, your research, uh, some of the best research statements I've ever seen were things that somebody started working on as an undergraduate, went to graduate school specifically to continue that, got a postdoc and then another postdoc in that same area, and now is one of the world's leading people in that area, and that's what they want to continue. In other cases, people do a postdoc and they say, enough of that, that isn't what I really want to do, and they'll propose something new. But I can guarantee you on the, on the reading end, no matter what, the, don't, don't read the ads too carefully. I just, I just, you know, the ads are complete nonsense. I mean, I, even in our own case, I have to confess, I'm on the, the recruitment committee the last two years. And here's how it happens. We say, gee, we ought to have somebody in the power and energy related area because we had a faculty member unfortunately pass on and we need to hire somebody in that area. And so uh, who, who on the faculty is in that area? Well, our guy died, you know, so we don't have anybody on the faculty that who can actually write that statement. So one of us poor slobs gets picked to actually write that. And so you write down what you think this area should, should uh, comprise. Well, then the other people on the faculty recruitment committee immediately pick on you and say, well, but there's all these other things that would be interesting too. And so just like in all committees, it gets comma this, comma this, comma this, comma this. And now you read the whole thing together and it makes no sense at all, okay? <laughs> However, that goes to the dean. And the dean says, well, I don't know if I have enough money to support this or that. So they'd start striking this out and modifying <laughs> that. And that's what they approve. And now when you get it back, not only does it make no sense, but neither you on the committee nor anyone in your department actually wants this person. <laughs> <laughs> and then four people like you out there read this ad and say, oh, well, I got to take my research and I got to, well, let's see, I'm going to have to cut this piece off and put it in that corner and then I'm, I'm going to, well, if I, if I put this upside down, I put that in here, and you end up ruining yourself in order to try to fit up. Don't do that. Assume that the, like, the first word is all that matters. Power and energy. Don't read the rest. Because they don't know what they want. I'm telling you, they don't know what they want. What they want is an outstanding candidate who's got a head on their shoulders who says, you know what you really want is the following. I, I'm gonna, I don't want to run out of time on this because I'm 
was so excited to tell you about the teaching philosophy statement, but can I give you one example? I was asked to go to a conference in, in San Diego, uh, in La Jolla, when I was a young assistant professor. Uh, and I was just getting my first couple of grants, and I was on shaky ground trying to get a program started and hire students and build laboratories and teach 10,000 courses, et cetera. Uh, and uh, I got asked to go to this conference because the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA, had decided they were going to put a whole lot of money into into our field. And uh, they invited certain people to go to this conference and present, and it was a competition. You're basically, they're going to decide on the basis of who presents what, what they're going to fund. This is just the way it works, and it works this way a lot. And I realized, I looked down through the list of people uh, that were presenting, and I realized, oh, this is great. There's uh, the nine top people in the field and me. And I disagree with eight of them. So what am I going to do? The night before uh, this uh, presentation, I had my presentation sitting in a hotel room. I still remember as if it was yesterday. I have all my 67 slides. I'm going through them, and I think, Armin, you're about to die. There's only two things that are going to happen here. Either you're going to tell everybody what they want to hear, which is that you think their research is great, and you have this little thing that you're going to do that just seems a little different from the way they're going. But really, ladies and gentlemen, it's not that different, you see in order to ameliorate, in which case the contract sponsor is going to say, well, why the hell should I fund that, right? If everybody else already doing it, those, those are all big guns, and you're a who? Where are you from, right? So that's not going to fly. The other possibility is I, I tell it the way it is, in which case I'm going to basically tell the contract sponsor, you know, this is really exciting, and I think all these people sitting out here who just presented are wedged. Okay? So I died a thousand deaths that night trying to decide what to do. Uh, but I was brought up in a particular way. And so the particular way is you go with the truth, period. So I stood up and I gave the talk. And I unfortunately had to follow the person out of the, out of the eight of those nine who I most disagreed with. So you got to imagine, here's 53 slides given by one of the top people known all over the world. He gives this whole talk. And he's done it. He sits down. And I stand up. And my first slide basically says, huh. <laughs> I would say that's great. Well, <laughs> okay, but I'm just telling you, you see your career pass before your eyes. Either of two things is going to happen. Funding comes, people fire arrows at every paper. No paper I ever want to publish gets accepted because those people are all the rep. You know what I mean? You need letters at the end of six years. This is year three. Three years from now, these people are not going to forget this. Right? Okay. You know, it sounds nice. Let me, let me tell you, when you're there the night before and it's 4 o'clock in the morning, it's a little tough. But you, you just aside, you know, this is what the agency stated. I read their paragraph. This is what they're looking for. And I didn't agree with that either. So I stood up and I said, you know, if we're going to have a research program in this area, here's my evidence why I think this way. I think this is the way we should go. And I sat down and I said, okay, that's nice. Now I'm going to find another. Maybe I could drive a farm tractor or something like <laughs> that. Uh, a week later, I got a phone call from Dick Reynolds at DARPA. He said, Armin, I'd love to have breakfast with you. And I thought, oh, God, here it comes. <laughs> Where? At the Huntington, uh, you know, what used to be the Huntington Hotel. Now it's like, I don't know what. They changed it four Langham. times. What's the hotel called now that's down on Oak Hill? The Langham. That's right. It was at what, what used to be uh, the Huntington Hotel. Anyway, so I go down there for breakfast, and I sit down, and I'm basically shaking. Right, I'm 20, 28, 29 years old and uh, trying to make a career go. And here's the top guy at DARPA in my field who wants me to sit down and breakfast. And he sat down and said, I love your presentation. You're exactly right. I'm giving you the largest grant in this program. And he told me a number. And I thought I was going to have a heart attack. It was more money than I could possibly shake a stick at. It, it, it made the whole beginning of my career take off like a rocket because now I had had the tools to do what we needed to do. He said, the reason I asked you to breakfast, I just want to hear more. And let's make a plan for the next couple of years. That's where it went. So I'm just trying to advise you an answer to your question. Don't be afraid to just you know, read what they said and then tell them what they really want, to, what, what they really should hear, not what they want to hear. And just go with your convictions. I, I, I hope you'll get that message also out of the teaching philosophy part of this. You're the DOT this week. Pardon me? <laughs> 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 what are the 
odds. Well, well, I, don't know. I don't know. If you call me up and I get to give the talk, I'll give you a better guarantee. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm asking you people whether you think you can carry this off. Can you pull this off? You have to. But you got to have the courage of your convictions. That's all I'm trying to say. Thank you. you got to have good evidence for it, but you got to have the courage of your convictions. Ladies and gentlemen, this is no different than uh, twice in my career. I have uh, done a literature search on something we discovered and found out there's 500 papers in the literature, in one case, 1,000, that say X, and we say X bar. You know, we basically are just going against everybody in the field and saying, no, I think you're, you're all wrong. That's, that, that's an interesting thing, the day you run, and you guys don't actually put something in the mail. You know what an envelope is? Did you <laughs> stamp? You know, in the old days, you'd stand at the mailbox in the rain, which I did once actually with a paper. You're, just look, you're looking at the mailbox, this little flap. You, you know what a mailbox is. <laughs> and, and you're looking at and you're just, again, you're seeing, you see this black hole with your career going in. <laughs> Either you're right, and this is going to be huge, or and, but everybody will be mad at you anyway. Or you're wrong, and that's it, you know, because that, that, you don't get to be wrong in a major way too many times. Uh, and so this, this process that we're talking about is not unfamiliar to any scientist. When I was a kid, I used to hear this phrase all the time. My mother always used to say, it drove me to distraction. If you can't stand the heat, get the hell out of the kitchen. So when I was young, I thought, what that means is if you get involved in something that where you're in over your head and you, and you don't think you can deal with it, you've got to find something. As I got more senior, I realized that's not what that means at all. What that means is the following. If you're doing something and telling the world about it, and you're not generating heat, namely people telling you that you're an idiot, you're not doing anything useful. Namely, if heat, then usefulness. If too much heat, stupidity. But if heat, then usefulness. You see what I mean? That's not something they teach when you're at this age, usually. You usually find that out the hard way as you go along, that the most significant things you can do are the things which lots of other people have vested interests in not believing, because it isn't the current paradigm. So after a while, you start to get used to what I'm telling you, that go ahead and just make your own way. What I would say this is if you, if you tell the institution that this is what you want to do, and that's not what they were looking for, good. Because you don't want that job. Because you wouldn't be happy in that job. It's a marriage. You're trying to find out by sending a missile into that institution with information, <coughs> right? You want to find out if what comes back is great enthusiasm or no, that's not what we're interested in. And don't be afraid of that process. Because I can tell you, the people that you work with make all the difference in the universe. If you're working with great people, you are going to be so happy. <laughs> If you're working with people who really don't understand what you're doing and don't really care about what you're doing, uh, having the job at all doesn't make, I know there's the, I'd like to eat, uh, that's, that's good. I'd like to feed my child, that's good. Uh, but uh, I, I guarantee you, you're at Caltech. I mean, come on, you're at Caltech. Uh, you people are not gonna want for jobs. You're not gonna want for something to do. The only question is, what is it that you're actually Can we talk about teaching philosophy for a bit? Well, again, very simple. I'd like to tell you what the purpose of one of these is, especially for those of you who are asking yourself right now, what's the purpose of a teaching philosophy? Then again, I'll talk to you about the content or the key components. And then I want to get to, and I'm hoping I'll have some time for this, I'd like to talk to you about the issues to consider, because I'm going to challenge you, I believe, uh, mentally very strongly about what you think I'm talking about when I tell you teaching philosophy and what I actually mean by it. So I, I'm, I've got a, a quite a number of these, and I'd love to give you some examples that I hope will shake you up. One of the key components uh, of a teaching portfolio is the teaching philosophy statement. What's a teaching portfolio? A lot of institutions that have a strong teaching interest will ask you for a teaching portfolio. That might be summaries of uh, student evaluations that you've gotten, classes that you taught, or TA. It might include, uh, hopefully, the teaching philosophy statement. It might include other evidence of teaching that you've actually done. It might uh, include a list of extracurricular teaching that you've done outside the university or outside the classroom. And the, the teaching philosophy statement has a purpose in forming a key component of that portfolio because it provides a natural way for you to organize the portfolio. Uh, it's term
determines the content of what's in it. And the portfolio itself, you can actually think of reversed. Normally, people put together all the stuff they've done. I think it's the other way around. You write the teaching philosophy statement, and the portfolio is the supporting evidence. It's the set of facts that support the statements that you make in the teaching philosophy statement. Well, second purpose is to establish your individual teaching goals and objectives. Now, you say, wait a minute. I thought I was writing this for an application for a grant, or I was writing this for a university position. But I'm going to tell you one of the most fundamental things that happens to you when you start thinking about writing a teaching philosophy statement is you, you first you realize that you don't know how to teach. Second, you, you realize you're not sure uh, if you understand what teaching is and what you should do about it. And third, all of a sudden you start to think and you realize, hey, wait a minute, there's a lot more to this than I thought. And you will find yourself changing by writing this. I've, had, I've given this talk uh, many times at USC over the years. I've had an awful lot of people follow up afterwards and tell me that it was a, a life-changing event when they actually sat down and took the blank piece of paper and tried to fill it in with this statement because it changed the way they thought about communicating the fundamental science that they're developing in their research. So this is an opportunity to focus on those things that you value and to find out what your values are in teaching in some cases. And it's an opportunity to develop your own set of teaching approaches and skills that are individual to you, that are specific and unique to you. And of course, at the bottom, you know, you understand me by now, at the bottom I put it's a required document for a whole bunch of things. Uh, for academic employment, for sure. And often now, believe it or not, in industry, people like to see a teaching philosophy statement without the word teaching. They like to see that you have a collaborative enthusiasm for spreading the things that you know within the company. That's something that's an absolutely critical uh, development in an awful lot of modern companies that are interdisciplinary. It's, it's crucial for promotion. Uh, we look at them very carefully at USC uh, for promotion to all stages. Uh, and it's a key element in many awards. And so I, I think it's actually a living document in the sense that once you come up with one, I keep going back to mine. I keep thinking of new things all the time. It's a, a really energizing process to ask yourself uh, not just I have a class to teach and I'm going to go pass some uh, information to people, but I actually have an opportunity to impact how people become uh, scientists and human beings of the future. Let me say it a different way. Um, by talking about the content and the traditional who, what, when, where, why, and how approach. So I'd ask you some questions. Who are you as a teacher and who do you want your students to become? Namely, what is it about you and teaching that's interesting to you? And if you had a set of students, imagine, given a set of students in the classroom, what would you want to happen in that room such that when they leave, they're different because of you? Hopefully better. What are your goals, your objectives, your values, your interests, the specific approaches that you take to teaching? Have you done some key teaching before? And if so, when? What is, what are the, what, give me some idea of what you've actually done in the past. I mentioned I was lucky. I started teaching in uh, Carver Mead's class when I was a sophomore at Caltech. But even before that, in high school, I was a tutor. So my interest and enthusiasm for teaching goes all the way back uh, to just after the American Civil War, relative to those <laughs> three years. Uh, where have you been influenced? And from where have you learned valuable lessons? obvious example of that is special teachers or significant quotes or unusual classes. There isn't anybody that I know of that's interested in teaching that doesn't think Dick Feynman was an amazing teacher. I mean, I, I, I'll tell you another, another very quick story. Once upon a time, uh, we had invited uh, Professor Feynman to Lloyd House at Caltech for dinner. And after dinner, we were all in the rec room and, and, and there were about six or eight of us left and uh, we, got, we all got a little soft. And uh, he started to wax philosophical, and we started to wax philosophical. And all of a sudden, Bill Reinick, who was one year senior to me, said, well, Professor Feynman, did you see the new edict from the provost, who was Neil Pings, who then became the provost at USC? But he was the provost here. So did you see the new edict from, uh, from the provost? He says, uh, there will be no classes anymore at 11 o'clock on Wednesdays. And Feynman, of course, says, why is that? And Reinick says, well, because the faculty you see always complain that they can't go to committee meetings because they're teaching. <laughs> and so the provost has a new idea that A, all committee meetings will be at 11 o'clock on Wednesdays, and B, there can be no classes at 11 o'clock on Wednesdays. 
so Feynman in one picosecond looks at all and says, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait. So if I were to hold a class at 11 o'clock on Wednesday, all 400 of you, freshmen, sophomore, junior, you'd all be available, and I could never go to a committee meeting? Damn. Next day on campus, Physics X, RP Feynman, 11 o'clock Wednesday, <laughs> all over campus. He was physically walking around campus, stapling the things up himself, and of course we were all following, because this was, this was cool. So it took about a day before he got called into Ping's office, and uh, the provost and he had a long discussion, and many of us were standing outside wanting to see if you know parts of people came out or what was going on. And he came out smiling and just kind of walked across uh, campus, and we thought, oh, good, it's going to happen. So sure enough, the next day, signs came up saying that it was going to be in 201 East Bridge, uh, 11 o'clock on Wednesday, <laughs> R.P. Feynman, and we all signed up. And he came into the class, and he said, okay, here's the deal. You can ask me anything in science, not just physics, but anything in science, except definitions. If you ask me a definition, I kick you out. But if you ask me how something works, then I will attempt to answer it in the time that we have. And he, I can't tell you how amazing this was, but we stayed up nights. Every Tuesday night, the lights were on in all the, in all the student houses. We had pizza delivered at 3 in the morning. You know, what we were trying to do is to sit around and come up with something that was going to stump Feynman. <laughs> right? And you got 400 Caltech undergrads, we have one here, trying to stump Feynman. So we come in and we elect some representatives who would sit in the second row and stick his hand up and say, Professor Feynman, you know, could you explain how water going down a grease cookie sheet breaks into little, little rivulets and what it takes for it to split each time and how many times it should bifurcate? I said, okay, that's interesting, bro. So he goes in the back and 201 each bridge, and he comes out with this little aluminum thing, and he, and he puts his hand on it, he rubs it in his hand, and says, that's good enough grease, you know? And so he dri starts dripping water from the faucet that's right on the lectern there, and then he starts writing things down, and at the end of 45 minutes, we're all sitting there completely aghast.